Thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Andrew Kircher. I'm Director of Public Humanities and Research at Bard Graduate Center, and I'm so pleased you're here. Uh, we are very fortunate uh, to have Arnold Clifford here to speak with us today, and, and also here with Arnold is Shauna Begay, uh, who is Arnold's mentee and apprentice in his complex and uh, um, unprecedented practice of being a geologist and an ethnobotanist uh, and an expert in all of these um, elements of weaving. This evening is part of a series of programs that are tied to our exhibition, Shaped by the Loom, which if you haven't seen, I strongly encourage you to go over to 18 West 86th Street, and you probably received a card as you came in. That card makes it so that at your leisure, except not on Mondays and Tuesdays, you can head on over to the gallery, show that card, and they'll let you in. And, and I do hope that you take that time to, to really take in this exhibition and also the exhibition, Staging the Table, the first exhibition, Shaped by the Loom, curated by Hadley Jensen, and Staging the Table by Deborah Crone. They're both here tonight. So let's take a moment to thank them for their work. <laughs> Shape by the Loom is so much informed, or, or rather invites us into an understanding of the relationship between Navajo weaving and the land, and important to that, central to that. And you'll see in the design of the exhibition is natural dyes and how they're produced and how natural dyes offers us a way into understanding this brilliant art form and its history. And so we're so lucky that Arnold Clifford is here tonight and that Shauna Begay is here tonight so that they can share all of, that they know, all that they bring to this artistry and all that, that Arnold um, brings to his community in with his knowledge of plants and the dyes and colors that can be produced. So. Uh, there's so much to Arnold's biography that I will not stand in the way. He tells his story better than anyone. Please join me in welcoming Arnold Clifford and Shauna Begay. Hello, good evening. Uh, I'd like to say it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. It's uh, a totally different world out here coming in from the Four Corners area, from the Colorado Plateau Desert. But I really enjoy being here. It, uh, people always ask me, how come you like going to the cities, you know? I tell them, I, you know, I've spent so many time out in the desert. I've spent so much time out in the forest, out in the wood, uh, the foothills of the mountains. And I tell them, I come to the, to the cities because the cities offer something that we don't have back home. There's a there's just an immense amount of like uh, things that are here like museums and libraries and a lot of things that, that I, I I I don't have the privilege to or access access to it so that's why I enjoy uh, traveling the country from coast to coast doing all kinds of lectures from San Francisco to Harvard to New York City to back down back down to Philadelphia and everything in between there so my training is uh, actually in geology. Uh, I'm a geologist, and I study the uh, Four Corners geology, uh, the Colorado Plateau geology. And then uh, my training also, uh, it, it's uh, I started off as, at 10 years old. My grandmother took me out into the field to learn about uh, Navajo ethnobotany. And I, at first, I started off uh, learning about edible plants. And then later on, I converted to learning about uh, dye plants because my grandmother was a weaver. And then I went into uh, learning about medicinal plants and tobacco, ceremonial plants, utilitarian plants. And so uh, by the time I got into my 20s, early 20s, I started learning about the, the whole floor of the Southwest. And I've been collecting plants throughout the whole Southwest and uh, trying to identify every species that I find. And I have my own uh, personal herbarium where uh, I store a lot of uh, pressed plants. And in my collection, I have probably like about 30,000 plants in my collection. And uh, I use a lot of my, geo my geological knowledge, especially stratigraphy, in order to figure out where all these uh, rare and endemic species are at. And so I've been finding a lot of uh, uh, undescribed plant species. And that's one of my, my drive right now is uh, when I go out there and collect plants is looking for new and undescribed species. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, I, I usually lecture on that as well. So, 
So my my background is pretty pretty broad, and I I do a lot of research and uh, uh, studying uh, the Navajo history, culture, and language. When I first uh, started my my school in in kindergarten, first grade, I didn't even know one word of English. So I had a I had to struggle through my early early years in grade school, and then uh, I you know uh, English came pretty easy to me. You know, despite me talking Navajo all my life, I'm still learning a lot of like words in Navajo, the esoteric words, the ceremonial words, and and some of the old old words that are no longer being used. So uh, uh, I'm still learning in terms of uh, the Navajo aspects of uh, of my teachings. So uh, tonight I'm going to talk about. Uh, as I'm going to first cover a little bit about uh, uh, the history of my grandmother and her weaving, and then I'm going to go into the actual uh, uh, some of the esoteric knowledge about weaving that's uh, not readily known anymore. I grew up uh, among all these elders that were weavers, uh, like. There's a lady by the name of Lucy Whitehorse and her mother, uh, Ruth Yabini, and then my grandmother, Sarah Charlie. And then there's another lady by the name of Helen Begay, and then Dorothy Benali. And so all these elderly ladies were pretty much uh, Tizan's must design weavers. And so they taught a lot about uh, uh, the esoteric side of weaving that uh, a lot of uh, other weavers haven't learned, learned yet. You know, the ones that are up and coming weavers that are very, very popular today. And that's the thing about uh, the weavers of the past versus like the, the, the younger generation of weavers because the weavers of the past, they, they took their profession to be more humbleized. And like the, the younger weavers, they're, they're, they're kind of like uh, uh, the, the people who buy their rugs, the traders and other collectors are very demanding of uh, having perfectly woven rugs. Like perfect symmetry and uh, 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 perfect colors and stuff like that. And uh, when you look at the, a lot of the older rugs, like some of the ones I have up here, a lot of these weavers they made deliberate mistakes. They would make a mistake in part of their rugs, and and even the color variation would, would vary quite a bit within the, within the, within that one particular uh, rug that they made. And it was a way for them to humbleize themselves. And they they were taught by their by their mothers and their grandmothers who were very strict in, in what they taught them. And they said learning how to weave was very strict because every aspect of weaving was uh, involved. It involved prayers, it involved singing, it involved uh, like uh, different types of offering. And, and, and so uh, it, it became very complicated to, to, to learn about it when, when they were uh, back in like the 40s and 50s and like 1930s and so uh, that's where they come from and they're they're told that you can't be perfect all the time you can't make perfect rugs all the time you have to leave yourself room for improvement on your next rug and so that that's the way they were taught and that's the way they they learn how to do things so I'll, I'll talk about that and then later on I'll Get a little bit into my my what I do as a as a collector, and then also what I do as a uh, uh, about uh, native dye plants. So I'll maybe there's like about 15 species that I'll uh, present here. So here's a sign that says "Welcome to the Navajo Nation," and this is kind of like uh, what I do is I travel and I present my culture to people from uh, across the nation, and this is the uh, current. Uh, reservation boundary that we have and let me see where's your oh there it is so uh, uh, I come from right in this region here this is the four corners area where Arizona Utah Colorado and New Mexico comes together so uh, I come from a small community uh, about right here called the uh, Cabato which means uh, uh, water like groundwater coming out from the bottom of, of the ground. And then uh, when you get down into this region, this is where uh, Shauna is from, right around uh, Rock Point. But currently she's living in uh, Farmington right now. And so it took uh, about 2,300 miles to get to here. 
you know, driving all the way across the, the, the country. It's a land that's very dynamic. It's a, uh, it's like semi -envir uh, desert environment. There's canyons, there's all these buttes, and there's a lot of uh, what they call lacolithic mountains. It's a, uh, it, it's it's a. Uh, there's a lot of contrast in terms of color, in terms of elevational gradient, in terms of the temperature. You can have like freezing temperatures, and an hour later it'd be like 80 degrees. You know. So it's a it's a very unique country out here to, where, where we came from, and this is my uh, my home home area where I come from. This is called the Carrizo Mountains, and this is where I uh, grew up, where I herded sheep, where I first uh, started learning about uh, native plants, and then later on I started learning about all these different features, geological features, and how these uplift happen. And this is called like a lacolithic mountain range. You have these uh, igneous rock seals that are laterally injected into these uh, sandstones. And then you have this uh, feeder dike that runs up into the mountain, feeding magma into this portion of the mountain. And it's a pinion juniper woodland with a little bit of uh, a sagebrush. Uh, this mountain range uh, by itself probably has uh, like about 900 different species of plants. So it's, uh, it's a very unique. Uh, I like to say that this uh, I live in this area and it's like living next to like four different national monuments minus the tourists you know so okay uh uh so here's uh i've been around sheep all my life as well right now i got rid of all my sheep because i'm trying to uh let the range land restore itself where all the grasses will come on back and these are the type of sheep that, that's called uh, navajo churros they come in all different uh, natural colors, like whites, reddish brown, blacks, grays, bluish gray, almost like some like yellowish brown. So they come in all different colors. And these sh sheep type were originally uh, introduced by the Spaniards around like 1540s, when the Spaniards first came to New Mexico, coming up from Mexico, moving north to, to settle uh, New Mexico. They they brought uh, about maybe 3,000 head of sheep with them is like food that they would use along the way. And over time, I think around about uh, 1590 to about 1610, is when the Navajos uh, acquired these sheep, maybe by trading, but for sure by, by raiding, raiding the uh, Spanish uh, settlements. And so it was the, at first you were purebred uh, Chiro sheep. And then later on, uh, when the, around 18, 40s, 1850s, uh, the mer merinos were introduced, and then probably about 1870s, 1880s were when uh, the rambolets were introduced. So they were crossbred with the original churros, Spanish churros, and what result? The result of that is what they call the the Navajo churro, and they have a uh, like really shaggy, long wool. They're very resilient. Uh, if they're very healthy, they can produce. Uh, their lambs two times a year, and then you can uh, shear them. I, I used to shear them two times a year in April and in September, and they, some of them have like four horns, like this one here. This ram has four horns, and so uh, after I finish my my shearing my wool, I would either donate it to uh, different weaving organizations or different weaving families. There's a family that I knew that that had a uh, uh, five, five people, uh, five, five ladies weaving from that family. So, I would give them all my wool, and on certain weavers, I would ask them to, I would commission them to make me a rug out of my the the, the wool that I produce. And uh, also, what I did is I, I I gave away a number of these. Like uh, when I was deeply in, into producing and raising sheep, I used to have like oh, two hundred head of sheep. Uh, uh, that I had on my in, in, in my operation, and out of that, uh, over the number of years, I probably gave away like uh, 900 hit 900 to 950 head of sheep for free. Because if you go with uh, like the Navajo Churro Association, they would say, All right, a ram would cost you like $500, a ewe would cost you like one of these would cost you like 250 to 300 dollars. A lot of our elders could not afford that. You know, our people are, a lot of people are poor. 
So I told him I, I would start a program where I, where I, I would just give you like 10 at a time, five at a time, maybe one RAM, two RAMs. And so over the years, that's what I did. I gave away like uh, probably about 950 head of sheep for free. And so it's a blessing back to me, you know, it's a blessing back to me. And that's why I did that. So when I share them, this is how I used to share them. I would use the old fashioned method of uh, using a hand shear. I didn't like using a, an electric shear because when you use an electric shear, it kind of roughens up the, the wool. And so when it, when it regrows out, and it, it's, uh, it grows uneven. And, it's, and it has a kind of a, a rough touch to the, to the very tips of the, of the wool. So I used to use an old shear like this, using the hand shear. And so it's uh, pretty difficult. There's not too many people that do this anymore. Everybody relies on electric shears these days. And then here's uh, my grandmother using the wool to produce uh, her rugs. And this is, uh, she's sitting at, one, uh, at her loom. And these are all uh, natural colored wool here. And then some of some of these, uh, like the reddish and part of the yellows and or yellowish orange are, are produced by different species of plants. And this is her, uh, she had like a large loom, a small loom, like maybe about five different looms that she had. She even had one, like one of these right here. And so here's one of the ones that she produced. This one is probably about going up like three quarters of the screen and going three quarters that way. It's a pretty large rug. And it's a, a classic Tizan's bus design rug. This is all made of, out of natural wool. The reddish part of it here, the reddish section around this border is uh, made out of a, a plant called Mount Mahogany. And you have to scrape off the the uh, the bark in order to produce that color there, and this uh, rug itself is uh, kind of neat because each rug has a story. And back as uh, in, in the previous photo that I, I showed you of the mountain, you see the red sandstone, the reddish color around here. This represents the red sandstone all the way around, and then the mountain itself uses that sandstone as a foundation to to push itself up. Because that red sandstone is very, it's a massive bedded sandstone where it, where it uses that, it, it's like, like using, like me standing up on this and pushing, putting pressure on it. That's how that mountain range formed. All that magma was laterally injected into that, into that, uh, into these different sandstone layers. And so this one here is the actual mountains, the Carrizo Mountains here. And then there's uh, these huge canyons there that we have. There's like five or six different canyons, and these represent the canyons that are that are within the mountain range. And then you have this uh this lightning feature. When you read when you learn about Navajo sacred mountains, there are some that are, are bounded down by lightning, some are bounded down by stone knives, some are bounded down by like uh, other other objects. So these are the lightnings that the lightning uh uh uh, that you see that that bounds this mountain and ties it into the ground and makes it very sturdy and then all the way around this border this wide border goes all the way around that chain lightning at night when you have a cloud here and a cloud there and there's like lightning between the two clouds and that's what this one represents here all the way around and, and then there's uh this little feature here these are like uh if you've heard about the Navajo long walk where back in uh, 1864 to 1868, Navajos were incarcerated over at Fort Sumner, which is near like in central New Mexico. They were taken from the res and from the reservation, and then they were uh, forced march to Fort Sumner, and they had to stay there for four years. And after uh, they came out of in incarceration, they were marching home. There was like a 10 mile procession. Out in the desert, and it, it, it is a is a, a ten mile long procession of people with backpacks or like uh, their their packs and leading horses and such. So all this is like a, a commemoration of the the long walk period that goes around the border like that. There's one on this side, and then uh, if you look at uh, this rug here, uh, this this part of this uh, this this comb here. One side of it is uh, beige, and the other side of it is uh, brown, and then beige and brown. And then you can see, like, this is uh, brown and beige. This is black and beige. 
So there's always some pattern, and they come in fours, but there's always one of them that 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 may have a, a little bit of a different color scheme. Sometimes they might flip that color around like this, you know. So this is uh, one of their one of the last ones that, that she made. And then here's another that, that that she made as well. You can see my brother's holding this rug up. Here's my brother's hands, and he sh his feet is down here. So he's standing there like that. And this is a uh, a Tizan's bus. Uh, actually, it's a, a uh, sand painting rug. And this was uh, developed is is a family pattern that my, my grandmother and her mom developed this back in the 1930s. I have another photo of uh, just the border itself with a little bit of the weaving, and that's what how my great grandmother used to weave. And my my grandmother, she just modified it a little bit to to uh, uh to make the pattern a little bit different. But it, it's a family pattern that they developed together. And by the way, uh, I forgot to mention uh, right here, these rugs are not just like flat two dimensional; they're like three dimensional. There's like the bottom layer here, the gray layer is like a, like a palette, and that that's like a, like an artist will have a their their uh, their canvas, and they they might have a background and they'll paint their images or whatever on top of that background. So that's what this represents is like uh, the palette of the of the uh, of the weaver, and then they make it three dimensional. There's like one layer upon another layer upon another layer. So if you go out towards the reservation, you'll see like mesas mesas with th different layers and that's what they're trying to emulate here using that type of uh, weaving patterns and then this one is, it, it belongs to what we call the the uh the beauty way chant <clears throat> and a lot of times uh the the sand paintings that are that are reproduced during ceremonial rites these nine day nine night ceremonies they would use a uh, pulverized rock or pulverized like grains of sand and they would actually make the patterns with their fingers like this and producing the the whole background the the different uh geometric features and the different uh holy people images on their on their sand painting rugs or on their sand paintings but when this one is reproduced in a ceremonial setting they use uh flower petals like different types of flowers like blue flowers and red flowers and so forth but this one tells a story about how uh, here's uh, what we call Black God, and then here's the uh, the Thunderbird. You have the coyote right here. Then you have the moon or the sun and the moon. And then you have uh, first man and first woman right here, depicted in uh, the Big Dipper and Cassiopeia. And here's the North Star, Polaris, right there. And there's like different constellations that are protectors of each quadrant of this uh, of this uh, rug here or this uh, particular painting. And uh, each one of these deities, you can see that there's a, a rainbow bar right next to them. And you'll see a rainbow bar here and a rainbow bar under the coyote, a rainbow bar under the uh, uh, thunderbird, and then there's a rainbow bar next to the black god. And then one near a uh, first man and the first woman of the sky. So they would use these rainbows to travel. They would take like a like a slinky. They would just toss it like this, and that rainbow go a very long distance. And when they stand on that rainbow, it's like an escalator that just transports them over a long distance like that very quickly. And that's why all these sand paintings have these uh, rainbow bars under them. So Black God is in charge of fire. Black God is in charge of of, of, of the heavens. Of the black mat, black matter of the stars of the planets, uh, the comets and, and all that, and then he's also in charge of uh, fire, big a big game like elk and deer, um, moose and stuff like that, and so here is his uh, his fireplace right here, right here, and then there's a uh, first man and first woman's fireplace. So the story goes that the coyote was very mischievous. He ended up taking stealing fire from from uh, Black God, and he took uh, the fire. And he this is his trail here. It goes to the tip of his tails and it starts over from the tip of his nose. And that's how first man, the first woman of the sky of the of the heavens receive fire. 
and then later on, fire was given to the humans through the uh, through the intervention of the of the of the cosmic couple. And so this red yarn that, that falls from his nose to his tail tip all the way back to Black God's fire is a trail of embers, red hot embers that are glowing. And that's why to this day, when you see the, the coyote, it has a black tip tail and a black tip nose. And that's where, where he got that from. So uh, there's a lot of stories like that, really unique stories about, about these rugs. And then here's uh, the lightning pattern again, the chain lightning pattern, this modification of this, of this rug. And then here's another image of the same rug, rug, uh, the same uh, uh, painting. And it's a little bit different, but it's essentially the same uh, characters on here. And then you can see how the color variation goes. This was uh, uh, produced from a, a plant called Rummix, Rummix hymenocephalus, which is a uh, Kanagri duck. And in Navajo, we call it uh, Chahatini, mean, meaning that uh, they're, it's like they have tubers like potatoes. They're about a foot under the ground. And so that that that's uh that's how they mature though produce tubers like that. So when I was like about maybe 15 years old, I helped to collect the plants and we made the dye and and so this is uh the wool that was produced uh she, this is this is where it came from. And then uh they do this deliberately too. See how the the collar is not totally solid. They did that because like when you go through like a a single day. Sometimes you'll have the clouds roll on in and they'll kind of darken darken the ground. And then the clouds will move on and then you'll have the sunny su the sun come through again. And then the clouds will come through, the sun will come through, the clouds will it's alternating throughout the day. And that's what they're trying to emulate here in in their in their rugs is, is how the color variation changes that way throughout the whole rug, you know. This one I uh I haven't seen it and seen this rug in about like 35 years. And then one time I, I, I went back to, I was in Durango, Colorado at this uh, uh, dealer, uh, art dealer. I relocated that rug. So he had a big hefty price on it. <laughs> and then here's another rug here. This is all natural uh, color uh, wool from the sheep, black sheep, white sheep, gray sheep. And then uh, this is like a white wool that uh, was further whitened. You take a, a rock type called uh, silonite, which is gypsum. It's like, uh, uh, I believe it's like calcium sulfate. And so it's a, it's a clear uh, mineral. They come like bladed forms. And, and uh, if you've ever heard about alabaster, which a lot of like, artists they use to make like sculptures, alabaster is also gypsum, but it's uh, uh, gypsum with a, a lot of impurities in it. So what we use is we use a clear colored gypsum, and then you uh, break it up as small as you can can make it, and then you heat it up. It's like you cook it. So once you cook it, that whole mineral will turn kind of like a uh, a whitish color. And so essentially what you're doing is a, you know, it's amazing how a lot of these uh, ladies from the past or elders is like learning about chemistry. And what you do is essentially when you cook gypsum, like a selenite, and cook it and turn it white, it turns into a, a, a mineral called anhydrite, where you drive off all the water, all that water gets driven off, and then the resulting uh, uh, white powder or pulverized uh, selenite, you would uh, keep cooking that down until you get rid of the whole thing and it turns to powder. And then what you do is you uh, get your, your, even though you have white wool, it might be kind of like a yellowish white and off, like an off uh, white color. You put your uh, uh, your gypsum like in, in, in a batch or like, a, like in, a, in a pot and you put that rug into that, all that powdered gypsum. You add a little bit of water, you rub it in, and it'll come out really white like that. So if you eat like a white flour, if you eat like white bread, you're eating a lot of gypsum. Gypsum is used uh, as a whitening agent. And like naturally, when you, uh, when you find uh, like a like a natural wheat is kind of like a 
beige color. And so they they would use gypsum to, to whiten it up. I think they also use gypsum to whiten up like eggs, unhatched eggs, because uh, the, the, the fresh eggs are usually brownish. And in the stores and the supermarkets, they sell you white eggs. So that's also been bleached as well. So uh, this is uh, from a... Uh, uh, from what we call the the uh, the mountaintop chant, it's a nine night nine day chant as well, and it the the chant is about bears, about mountain lions, about wolves. If you've had any unnatural contact with them, they say that if you don't if you don't remedy yourself with that unnatural contact, you you start getting real mean, you get mad and. And then some people even start developing like hairs on the back of their neck, like a bear. So, so they had to go through the ceremony in order to, to uh, uh, heal themselves that way. And it's a very complex uh, ceremony. It has a very long, extensive story associated with it as well. So these are the holy people here. There's different, uh, four different holy people here. And they all have a different colored bird. That's sitting above them, hovering above them, and then uh, on the side, on their uh, left hand, they're holding up different colored corn. There's like gray corn and kind of like a whitish corn, and there's maybe yellow corn up here. And then on the opposite, here's the yellow corn. So on the opposite side of it, you have these bears that are following that holy person. On the on their right side, each holy person is holding. A bag of tobacco, and the the bears will smell that tobacco, and it it, it it attracts them, and that's why they're following that holy person in a clockwise fashion, like going in this direction. And then uh, you can see there there are tracks, individual tracks, and on each individual track you see a small rainbow. And then here's another depiction of their tracks with uh, rainbow bars, and then uh. On each holy person, you see this uh, yellow, yellowish colored footprints that's coming off the holy person. They said uh, there's a, another ceremony when they did a, a a dance of the what they call the nightway chant, the Yeviche. They said when they first performed it, they performed it right under the White House ruins there in Canyon de Shea, in uh, Arizona. And they said when the holy people dance, they had they dance in a uh, knee deep pollen, corn pollen. And so that's why they have, every time they take a step, they have a white yellow palm that they leave behind on each step. And once again, this is the, the sun and the moon in the middle. This is the black matter behind them, black, black God's body. And then on the outside, you have you have uh, this uh, what they call the early morning dawn God. So if you look, Especially if you're out in the plains or out out in the uh, out in back in the back home in the deserts, uh, maybe even here, if you get up to a, t a tall building and you start looking towards the east, right before sunrise, like about an hour and a half before sunrise, the whole land will turn appear to turn whitish. You know, even though it's still kind of dark, you'll have like white clouds, white the white uh. A cloud sky, and then you'll have the whiteness on the ground, and that's the, what we call in the whole God means the, the time when the ground turns whitish. So that that's what this uh the dawn God is a protector of this painting here, and so the opening is to the east, and then right here you have two bats that are protecting that entrance to the east, because bats are like early morning creatures. They go about at night. They come back to their dens or wherever they. They roost that is uh like in the early mornings, and that's why it's associated with the with the dawn god here. And then here's another rendition of it, of that same uh, rug. This was uh my grandmother did this for uh, a professor from UNM way back in the late seventies. So I went to his home one day and I asked him if I could take a photo of it, and he allowed me to take a photo of that. And here's one called uh, Holy People, they're holding uh, otter skins. And these are like different types of uh, reptiles. And here's a corn in the middle with the Navajo basket. And here's a, 
the central on sand paintings, like right in the central, you'll see like a uh, a dark uh, like bowl of water, and then you have the rainbow, which indicates moisture. And then this is a a rainbow god right here, all the way around. And then up here you have the like a raven or a magpie, and then you have here are the holy people holding otter skins, different types of uh, colored skins, and then their bow and arrows are on the opposite opposite hand. And then you have uh, these two protectors here of this of this uh, like otters that are protecting this whole sand painting. And uh, later on, she started producing uh, Tizan's bus design rugs. And so this is a uh, a pure Tizan's bus design rug with a. She's using that same pattern again around the, the edge. But this is a little bit different than the one I showed you uh, earlier. And so this is a uh, a two, two-sided uh, uh, Tizan's bus design rug. Here's another version of it. A different version of another Tizan's bus design rug. And here are the, the lightning uh, that goes all the way around. It's kind of neat. Uh, let me see if I can see that feature here. Okay, uh, all these uh, designs here, they have these these uh, little teeth. There's like three teeth on each one of these going all the way around. But if you get up here, there's five of them. And then uh, when you look at the, uh, like this design, here, you have these like little uh, triangular features right in here. Along the side, along the side. And then right here, you can barely see but I'll show you one if you come up closer later on there's like a phantom diamond right here same design but it's uh, a little bit darker green than what you see here and then when you look at this uh this feature here you have a brownish border up here and then you have the maroon border on the outside you'll know, have the maroon border and you'll see how the maroon border cuts into this design as well and you'll see how the brown comes on down and goes part of this uh, pattern and you can see it very well on one of the rugs that I'll show you later and so that's uh, typically how a lot of the uh, uh, more traditional weavers would have woven their rugs here's another one that's all this one's uh, an, a, a dye plant I believe this was made out of uh, oak bark and here's a uh, mount mahogany uh, uh, dye that was used and then the rest is all natural color uh, sheet wool. And this is also another... My grandmother is kind of interesting because she made a lot of different designs. And sometimes she would incorporate two gray heels with uh, Tizan's bus design weaving. When she was about eight years old, her mother uh, took her out into the, into the wilderness area. And this is early in the morning before sunrise, and they found a real nice, complete spider web. And so what they, what she did, what her mother did was she prayed in the morning. She put corn pollen on the web. She put corn pollen on my grandmother's hands. And then she held my grandmother's hands, and she put the, her hands through that spider web. And then she rubbed that spider web all over her, her, her hands, her arms, and her shoulders. So she uh, ceremoniously took on the aspect of uh, like a, like a, what a spider, how they could weave, you know. And so after that, all these patterns, all these different variations of different types of weaving, like the female dress coat, we call it bead. And then there's another uh, weaving style called the yoga, which is a very thick, 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 thick woven rug. And then we have saddle blankets. We have the the regular rugs, now we have tapestries, and then even the like this top one here on that big, big mound there. That's a, a vest that she made for me, and so uh, she she was able to uh, do all this stuff without much effort, you know, because as a young young lady, that's how she was taught, and that she went through that uh, spider woman ceremony in order to attain that. So here's one of her. Uh, her saddle blankets with the tassels down below here, right down along the bottom. This one gets a little bit longer. 
And here's another where she used the Rummix to make that yellow inside a, a, bounder, a border. And then the, the lavender color, this came from a, from a, from a mountain shrub that they call a gooseberry or currant. There's a certain species that produces kind of like a, 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 a dark purplish colored berry. And so she took that berry and she uh, meshed it up and then put a little bit of water in there and boiled it a little bit. And that's how she created these uh, lavender colored uh, parts of the yarn. There's a uh, mountain mahogany there, this reddish part again. So this is a uh, real nice uh, uh, setup like it that she produced. Okay, here's a loom, your typical loom. There's a, a shorter uh, example right there. And so you have uh, a, a long, essentially it's a, uh, it's a loom that has uh, two sides like this. Here's one side and here's another side. And then you have like a log or, or like a, a board at the bottom that corresponds like right up in here at the bottom. And then you have the slower, um, the slower bar that, that, that where you put the, the loom across. And the loom is called nanolje. The whole thing is called daisto, you know, or, or uh, meaning that what you're going to weave on. And, and then uh, uh, here's the web, what you're weaving. And then there's a bestest on it. You got this one right here. It means it's uh it, it's uh something that's uh woven together to, to hold that rug on along the edge. And then you have this uh salvage cord that, that normally runs on the outside of the rug here. The salvage cord here it is. And then there's another one on this side. And a lot of the younger weavers that are out there today, <clears throat> they don't know how to do this. Because you have to know how to control the the the, uh, the tension on it. If you make it too tight, the corners will curl up on you. So they, they try to avoid that today to, to, to make their blankets. But the older ladies, they, they all knew how to do that. They, they learned it through over the years of, uh, of their weaving careers. And then you have the, the, the shuttle stick here. Uh, and then you have the batten, which is called Be'etsoi. They are... Uh, be that's a yeah. This one means uh, you use like a like a stick to, to 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 put through there, or it might be held together like this heddle rod here. And then you have uh, uh, the upper portion. This is used to tighten up the the loom, kind of like a zigzag pattern. So essentially, what this whole whole uh, rug represents is uh, it was taught through Spider Woman and Spider Man. A long ago, Spider Woman was uh, bored, and and her husband decided to to make these tools for her. He made all these tools like uh, the the shuttle stick, the batten, heddle rod, and then there's also like a carter. There's like a carter, and then there's like, like a comb that you beat down the 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 wep, the wep on. And so each one of these tools were made out of turquoise. White shell, white shell, turquoise, uh, abalone shell, and then jet. So each one of these different items were made out of those four different mineral types. And so th those were kind of like sacred uh, tools that she had to, to use. And then they developed the, uh, the loom itself. And down here at the bottom, this, this represents the ground, Mother Earth, that you're standing on. And then up on top is uh, the sky that, that's right in here. We believe that there's like one orb with another orb with another orb. So the further you go out, you get into the stars and the heavens. And this is uh, right in the heavens right here. So this is where all the stars are at, the planets are at, and the uh, black mass. And then you go deep space up here. And that this quarter here represents... Uh, uh, it represents the Milky Way, and then the the loom itself, uh, the the warp itself, it represents male rain. We have female rain and male rain. The female rains are very gentle, and they come down like throughout the whole day, maybe overnight, and maybe throughout the whole day. And then the male rain, it just comes in like 
one hour. And you get like flash flooding from it, you get all this lightning, and you have a lot of water that comes on down. So the moon itself represents the male rains coming on down. And this is one of the reasons why I stress on this uh, outer salvage part, because the salvage part, if you can look on those, you can see them. They're twisted. And then you'll go the, with the yarn coming through here, and the ne next one will be twisted, and the next one will go through there, and so forth. And so, a lot of the younger weavers are making their rugs without that salvage cord. And it, it, the salvage cord is important because it represents the lightning. When you have male rain, you have that lightning that, that, that strikes the ground. So you have the, the male rain and you have lightning on each side of the, of the, of the saloon. And then when the, when, the, when the ladies are weaving, they have their combs like this and they'll tap it down. And you'll hear that sound like, like that. And so that's the sound of thunder. So it's making that complete cycle of thunder, rain, and male rain coming on down. And that's why they, they, they did that. They were trained to do that. And so uh, that's why like there's a lot of uh, taboos as well. A lot of... Uh, times that they tell ladies they'll they'll tell their their apprentices or their daughters saying that you never weave when it when it when it's raining you know because uh, uh the lightning people will hear you the thunder people will hear you besides that when you're it's very logical when you think about it because when you use that comb to like between these uh warps when they're using that comb to push it on down you're creating friction static friction and if you have a large loom with a large rug and you're doing that, uh, you'll have a, 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 there's a potential for lightning to come and strike your home. Even you yourself sitting at your loom. So that's why they, there's a lot of taboos like that that they talk about. Uh, let me, Shauna. Uh, my mentor, Shauna, she wants to, Explain that a little bit. Or... Good evening. Thank you. Um, it's good to be here. Thank you, Bard, for inviting us. My name is Shauna Begay. Um, I'll introduce myself in Navajo, which is what we formally do. And I just think it's cool to share my language. So, Yate, She Shauna Yin Shia. So I, uh, you guys think you're getting, you're getting a lot of information right now. I'm, I work with this guy and I've been working for, with him for the past 11 years and he's my, uh, Navajo Britannica. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so I've just like him, I've, been, um, I was raised with my grandmother and um, her friends as well, and they were a lot of them were weavers. And this uh, loom here actually was given to me just recently by um, my uncle, whose wife, my aunt, was um, a weaver, and she was also a teacher. Um, so when I told him that I wanted to learn how to weave, he said, "Okay." great, here, take this, take it and use it as a teaching tool. Um, also, uh, I had everything written down. I should have brought my notebook. <laughs> um, so I just would like to um, give thanks to Arnold, as always, to, for all of his teaching uh, on the field. We were out in the field and uh, yeah, and it's been, it's been this long, it's been so much uh, to learn, and I'm just looking forward to uh, the journey. And you know, it's brought us to New York, the East Coast twice now, and um, I would just like to express that whatever you learn uh, from our culture, if you choose to take up weaving, um, the humble thing to do would be to give back and teach as well. Um, and I'm looking forward to that day when I will be able to do the same for 
my students. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me go through this one very quickly. Uh, this is my plant press, and that's my motto up there. Uh, plant press will travel. So this is taking me all over the place uh, studying plants like I mentioned earlier. And that's how I go about in the desert, uh, desert environment, carrying my portable press on the back. And then I take photos that way before I collect them. And I do this because you get back to the ground, and that's your mother earth. And these plants that I study, they're all what we call holy plant people. And you talk to them. You introduce yourself and say, I'm here for this person. I'm here for this reason. I'm here to collect you for, for studying, for medicine, for tobaccos, and so forth. And then you would make an offering. You would make a prayer and then also maybe a song to give to them to, to uh, commemorate the, the holy plant people. And so this is the way I greet them, say hello to them, and, and get close down into the ground. And then here's my uh, temporary plant press. When I collect plants, I put them into these cardboards, and I'll smash them, I'll flatten them out. And then I'll have a, a, a collection like this. These cabinets, they actually came from Harvard University. They're well over 100 years old and very heavy. And so these are the unprocessed uh, plant specimens that are still in uh Newspapers. Then, then once I get them processed, I put them into these uh, genus folders based on family, based on uh, genera,s and then species. And then so here is a, a typical specimen. Sean has done like several thousands for me, maybe about five thousand different plants that she's helped mount and help uh, process. So it's a it's a very tedious process. Then I have all these, like how I have my genus uh, names on here, on all these different species of uh, Sinosis, which is uh, buckthorn. And then here's a, a typical uh, 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 voucher specimen with its uh, plant label, with all the description of where it came from. A scientific name, the family, that's my Carrizo Mountain Herbarium. My name, my collection number, and when I, the date that I collected this specimen here. And then here's uh, my colleagues. It took us 20 years and we put this book out. This is available on Amazon.com. And it's probably like about 80 bucks. And it should be more, like $200. But we, we all signed the waiver. All of us are four co-authors saying that we're not going to get any kind of uh, profit from the from the sales of the book. And that allowed our, the, the prices to remain low so students could afford it, you know. Ken Howell and Linda Mary Reeves are from San Juan College. Their CEO came from Northern Iowa State. And uh, myself down here. It's a big old thousand, six thousand page book. And here's our book signing party. You know, so I took a short break and uh, decided to take a photo of my colleagues here. There's Steve, Ken, and uh, Linda Reeves here. And then there's the turkey. The turkey is uh, responsible for all the uh, the native plants. So tomorrow I'm going to talk about uh, Navajo ethnobotany. And I'll uh, brush up more on this one. Every color of it has a has a has a story related to it. It's where our domesticated uh, seeds come from, like corn, beans, squash, melons, and even tobacco. There's a lot of tribes that teach about three sisters in terms of agriculture. I teach uh, four sisters. So, and then there's uh, uh here are the uh, another rug, and then here's our, our the four sisters. You have corn. Yeah, beans, uh, squash, and or squash and tobacco on the side. So that's uh, and this is the whirling log. This is our, our rendition of the whirling log. You have uh the Western God, talking God. Then you have uh the humpback gods on each corner here. And so the humpback gods are very important. Here's a rendition of it. He's uh, in charge of all the uh the native natural vegetation that we have. And it has a crown of, uh, of, of weather. Here's chain lightning, that lightning between the clouds at night. And these are woodpecker feathers where they represent like during the day when you have rain. And then the, the clouds will kind of open up. And you have very narrow rays of sunbeams coming through the clouds. So that's what that represents. And then these are, are it's, it's horn. When you look, especially out west, when you see these thunderheads coming in, 
you'll see these clouds that build up like about 30 to 40,000 feet into the air. And it's dark blue, dark gray, and that's when the rain is coming. And that's what this one represents here. And then it has a rainbow around its back. It has these eagle feathers. These eagle feathers, they show up like early in the morning that I mentioned about how the ground turns whitish. You'll see these sun rays coming over the eastern horizon, so that's what these feathers represent. <clears throat> and then this dark sack is like a backpack. It has dark clouds and darkness uh, that's uh, mixed in with it. And all these white bars are all different types of atmospheric precipitation. The male rain, female rain, hell, dew, sleet, snow, and mist. And then inside that bag, you have uh, all the native plant seeds, all the all the le all the uh, uh, grasses, all the flowering forbs, all the uh, flowering shrubs. And so these humpback gauze, they carry around a, a planting stick right here. And they would dance like this and when during the coldest parts of winter, when you get extensive cover of fog, they would be out there and in, in, in a, a number of them, they would carry that planting stick like this. And every once in a while they'll shake their back. And when they shake their back, they'll say, a woo, a woo. And when they say that, all these uh seeds would fall on out. And while they're dancing, they would use that planting stick to poke them seeds into the ground. So during the early springtime and early summer, you get all this renewal of uh, new flowers coming on out. So they're responsible for revegetating the earth. They're fertility gods and uh, abundance and, 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 and it's all about plants. And then uh, here's uh, one of our first dive plants. This is called Samothrus bulbosa onion, uh, onion spring parsley uh, eji. Means it's mainly living, dwelling in the ground. There's a long root like that. And that root is like a carrot. It's in the umbo family, the carrot family, the parsley family. And so the carrot itself is edible. It's all whitish and it tastes a lot sweeter than uh, than, uh, than carrots. And then when you get done with that, uh, you, you peel the outer bark of it, the, the outer rind of it. And if you get enough of it, you can produce like a yellowish, uh, uh, yellowish brown dye off of that. And then uh, you have, here's a, here's the root that I talked about. Right here, you can see that rind. It's kind of like a brownish color. So that's the part that we would use for our dye. And then the central portion, we would eat like a carrot. And then once these flowers mature, they, 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 when they produce their fruits, it's like eating uh, edible medicine right off the plant. It has a very distinct medicinal taste to it. And then here's uh, Allium cernuum, uh, um, nodding onion. And then now what we call it, a lot of our uh, our onions are edible, but this one is, uh, we like to reserve this for the ravens and the crows. And uh, normally we, we wouldn't eat this type of food. And you can tell right at, on their inflorescence on their flower where, where, where it's nodding like that. That's where the, the name comes from. Sir Newham up here means the nodding flowering head, the nodding uh, inflorescence. And then down at the bottom, it has a it, it's a bulb of like onion, and it has that reddish maroonish colored uh, outer skin of it, the covering. It's like uh, that purple or reddish maroon onion that that they sell in the, the markets. So that's the part that we would use. We would peel off all the bark or the the outer covering, and then we would uh, produce a uh, like a a pinkish red dye off of that. And then here's a uh, uh, Atchiflex Garden Rye Variety Cuneata, uh, Castle Valley Saltbush, Dark Ocean Tkel. So we, we recognize all these different species of Atchiflex and we call them, this is their Navajo common name, Dark Orange, and then we have modified names. Tkel means kind of broad. And this, uh, the, the flowering portion of it are edible. We make flour out of it, grind it up like into a meal. The leaves are also edible. Uh, and then we use the leaves, the whole plant, to produce a uh, a dye that's kind of like a grayish green color. It's also uh, a dye plant as well. And then we have uh, wild spinach. This is called Kiyomi Ludia. Wa, uh, uh, wa tsui, which means the yellow bee plant. So it's, uh, it's a, uh, a selenium concentrator. So if you're going to use it for edible food, you have to be very careful because you boil it, you pour it off, you boil it, you pour it off, and in the third bowl, you can eat it because it has a lot of selenium in it. And selenium is kind of tricky because if you don't have enough of it, 
it, it's uh, it, it gives you like uh, health problems. And then if you have too much of it, it's fatal. It becomes fatal. So there's a, especially for cattle or, and livestock, it, uh, they'll abort their young ones if they don't have enough of it. So uh, the, the flowering portion of it here, the, the yellow tops, these are used to produce a, a light yellow colored dye as well. And here's uh, Mount Mahogany. I brought some of the, uh, the bark. So on uh, Saturday, I'll be producing like uh, a couple different dyes and I, I shaved off the bark last night at, at the barred hall, sitting there, I snuck in the, snuck in the branches and I was sitting there partly last night, early this morning to, to shave them off. And you use the, uh, the bark itself, especially towards the root, and it produces kind of like a reddish, reddish colored dye. And there's another plant that we use, mix it, mix in with it to, to produce our, our red dyes for the reddish moccasins. So, so we call this a uh, but the real Navajo names means uh, it means it's uh, uh, it's kind of the, the rocks, it grows out of rocks where it kind of pushes up all the rocks and the rocks get all broken up. And that's kind of kind of what it means. And then we have uh, the question which is this broadleaf uh, yucca, or not yucca, but uh, uh, broadleaf uh, cactus, uh, prickly pear cactus, uh, We have two different species. There's a uh, polycantha. Polycantha has more spines on it, and then the it has uh, dry fruits where those fruits will fall right on off. And you can collect these fruits. Uh, you got to be very careful though. If you get a like a fork stick, you put it into the uh, into the fruit bottom, and then you would take pluck them out that way. And then there's another plant that we use that has like grayish uh, colored uh, hairs on the uh, on the leaves and stems. So we fold that up into a big wad, and then we rub it all over this. This one here, see that spine? Yeah. I think it's. Uh, I would rather be poked by this one than by that one. Because this one will put like 200 minute, 200, 300 minute spines into your fingers. They're very hard to take out. And so that's why we use that plant to clean it off. It's edible, fresh. And you can also boil it, turn into jam. You can turn into like, uh, like dried fruits. It kind of tastes like kiwi and strawberries. And then uh, what you can do too is uh, once you, if you have enough of it, you would take the, uh, the, uh, the, the reddish fruits itself and then pulp it, kind of mash it up, and then you would put cold water in it. And then after you have it settled, like sitting there for a day, you can add your, your wool to it. It will produce, depending, you can put it in there for a week to two weeks to three weeks. The longer you keep it in there, the more intense your reddish colors will come out, like rose pink. So it's a really neat uh, dye that you can use. You don't boil this one. You just uh, use the cold water to produce that color. And then there's a uh, Sirasia fenderi, Fenders Globe Mallow, a Zentini. So this is uh, a, uh, a medicinal plant that you use for any kind of stomach trouble. Like if you have uh, like a, a stomach ache or in, intestinal problems, you use the, 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 the stems and make a medicine out of that. And then we also use the flowers, those orange flowers that we boil it to produce a kind of like a pale orange pink dye off of that. So it's also a, uh, then on a good banner here, you'll see how much uh, uh, they'll produce huge blocks, like two square miles, three square miles of orange. So it all depends on the year that, that, that when they flower out, if they get intense like that. And this uh, yellow plant that's down here at the bottom, this is the plant that's used to clean off the, the glocket hairs, the glocket spines on the on the individual fruiting capsules of that uh, opuntia. And then there's a uh, broom saintweed. Uh, we call it matchweed, good regis, sorotri, chililgesi. Uh, chililgesi means uh, when somebody walks up behind you, and they'll say, whoop. You get all scared, you get startled. And that's what it means. So in a way, it's used for like a protection plant. You, there's like five over the five plants together that you burn, you get their ash, and they would use like for blackening rites, putting it on your forehead, your arms, your your legs, or whatever. It's to protect you from evil, uh, like something bad. And then on uh, like new homes and new buildings, 
when they do blessing rites, they will use that that uh, ash of that and put it around the edges to keep out that evil as well for protection and for, for blessing. And then it's also used as a heart medication. Like for, for, the, for the heart, it strengthens up your heart. And then you can use it at the top uh, yellowish uh, part of the plant or even the, the green leaves and it'll produce a, a dye like a light uh, green to like a yellowish uh, light yellow colored dye from, 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 the, from the flowers. So this is also another dye plant that we use. And then there's uh, the Persia Trident Tata Antelope Bitter Brush. A way it's odd, it means a uh, baby's cradle. And on the larger shrubs, they have very soft uh, bark. And they would gather a bunch of it and then they would line it at the bottom of the cradle boards. So it was a, a natural uh, diapers for little infants. And then the, the leaves of these, uh, you use the leaves, you, you boil it and you can make a, a greenish yellow dye off of that as well. And once it's in flower, it's very, very fragrant. Like if you have tan plants at the back of the room, you'll smell it up here. So it's a, it's, it's also very easy to transplant these into like your rock gardens and so forth. And then we have uh, this plant called uh, Ribes montiginum, uh, gooseberry currant. They produce uh, uh, like the uh, lavender colored uh, dyes you can get off of that. And one of its main uh, purpose, the name of it means bitch in just I, means uh, when you when you uh, harvest a deer, you would take that deer and you would lay its head towards your home, that directs all the good luck back to your house, and then you would butcher that deer, uh, either at the base or laying on top of the shrub here, and that's what that means. Which in just I means the butchering, butchering to that plant. And then there's a. Uh, uh, Atroplex conescence, four wing salt bush, Duhuji Bay. This is uh, an edible plant, <clears throat> an edible plant, and also the leaves are used to produce like a grayish green dye as well. And then on the on the straighter stems, on the straighter stems, uh, you, you make uh, like arrows out of them for weapons of war. And then, uh, uh, let me see, whoops, wrong one. Then we have this one, uh, it's a mistletoe. This one's called Ford Dendron Juniperinum uh, Juniper Mistletoe. Thought uh, means there's a basket up, up above you. Uh, means a basket. Thought means it's, it's kind of a, above you. And so this is also another multi use plant. Uh, it's an edible plant once it produces its uh, fruits. And then you can uh, uh, use it for making a kind of like a yellow screen dye as well, uh, just spoiling the whole plant. Then it's also another uh, heart medication. It's used for strengthening up your heart as well. And then I also collect them for, I used to collect them in big old bundles like that and toss it into my sheep crowd where the rams and billy goats would eat it. And so it's very tasty to them. One thing that's uh, surprising is we don't use it for like the, like the Anglo culture where they see a mistletoe. You stand under and you can kiss your girlfriend or something, you know. <laughs> So, so that's a, a very important plant. They're parasitic. They 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 shoot down their their stems into the xylem of the of the of the juniper. And over time, you can see in the background the picture is kind of like the, it it lost its leaves. So it'll par, uh, parasitize that juniper for like for like about twenty years before it finally kills it off. And then we have sunflower helianthus. There's different species. He, uh, the hili so means the big sunflower. This is kind of neat because I I used to get a, a greenish colored dye off the off the leaves, a light green. Then I'll take all the petals on its own, and then it'll give me like a, a yellowish dye. And then the the middle portion of it where the where the seeds would be produced, if it dries out a little bit more, I would take a bunch of that, kind of break it up and boil it, and it'll produce a, like an uh. A bluish, uh, gray, like an iron gray dye. It's a really, really neat uh, dye color that that it, that it produces. And so here's the Romix hymenocephala. Uh, the bottom part, way down the bottom, is uh, where the tubers are, like a potato, attached potatoes. And when Andrew called me there before coming up here, this is what I was looking for. 
uh, finding it under a cover of snow, you know. And so it's a, it's a dye plant once you use the, the roots of it, the potato portion of it, and then this part of it. Maybe about six inches off the ground, you would break it there, and then you would get a knife and split it in half. And then on the inner fillings of that stem, you would scrape it out, and you, you it makes a really tasty uh, rhubarb pie as well, you know. Oh, hey, weaving tools. I, uh, there's not a whole lot that I'm going to cover, but uh, uh, I'll at least get into some of this. Here's a uh, uh, Roos trilobata, or Roos aromatica, variety trilobata, sumat skunk bush, and we call this chilchin. Chilchin means uh, uh, the, like a plant or a shrub that's smelly. And when you get to like root, uh, this uh, sumac, you collect them, you can really smell it. So the stems itself, on the stems of this plant here, they're very flexible. You can use the, the stems to produce baskets. Then you can peel off the bark, split them, buy it, and then also use that uh, outer weave on the on the basket. Hmm. And then these berries here are edible. They're edible. They're uh, we make. It's a uh, delicatessen among uh, the Navajos there back in the Four Corners area, and we make uh, what we call chichin, and, and you, you use you. Dry them out, you collect them, dry out the berries, and once they dry out, then you grind them up. And then when they grind up, you start boiling them with a little bit of flour, and then you reduce it, and then it turns into like a porridge. It's, it's a very tasty treat. So, and then you can also use the, 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 the fruits, the small berries, to produce kind of like a maroonish colored dye. And then uh, the, the plant itself, like the, if you use the, the bark, or the stems, you can uh, uh, burn it a little bit, or even the berries, and then you add that to your your dye mixture. It acts like a like a like a mordant. And mordants are mainly like rocks, like alum, or else like uh, uh, different types of igneous rocks that has like copper or iron. And what that does is the the, the metal ions it helps uh, attach the the dye to the plant itself, or a dye uh, to the to the wool, and I've, I've tried this before. Like uh, like iron, it comes to like plus two, plus three, plus four on the ion charges. So if you use a plus two solution, your 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 dye is going to turn out to be like a uh, like a yellowish color, and then you make a, a plus three, it'll turn reddish, and if you use a plus four, it'll turn greenish. So it's kind of neat how you play with uh, not only the pH but also the the uh, the, the different charges of metal ions that, that 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 you can use. And then there's uh, uh willows, Salix azigua, coyote willow. These are used in ceremonies where the the, the stems about that long, about six inches long, four inches long, would be cut to make our uh, prayer sticks to depict different deities. And then these long, slender sections, the long sections could be used to make like head of boards, like, like what you see, they're going all the way across. And so that's that's how, that's what you use to produce those. And then we have uh, juniper, juniper berry. Uh, uh, the juniper berry and also the uh, the sumac, it has uh, what we call tannic acids and tannins. And that's a, a very good mortar that we use. And so this is a multiple use plant, multiple use tree. I could lecture on this tree for 30 minutes alone. And so, and then uh, what the goal is to try to, these uh, berries are edible. You know, they make uh, gin out of uh, juniper berries. And so you can use these and eat them fresh. You eat like four of them, that taste will, will stay in your mouth for a whole day. <laughs> <laughs> And one of the tricks of collecting these too is uh, uh, a lot of people they don't know is like you see how the, the tips are greenish? They will collect them in this stage and it's not ready. You have to wait until the very tips of these turn kind of like a reddish brown color. Once it turns a reddish brown color, then you can collect a whole bunch of it, burn it, and then pulverize it. Then you can use it to add to your food, like your blue corn and other corn dishes. Then you can also use it to uh, to produce your your mordants as well. And then you, there's my two friends. 
Mexican spot. I studied them too. One time I called in four of them. I had one sit on my hat, jumped up a foot above me. And then these two were right here on each side. And then their, their mother owl was probably right where Hadley's at, you know. So they sat there for two minutes doing, hooting at us, hissing at us, and doing their little dance. But uh, I threw this in because you can also use the, the bark of Gamble's oak. You, you trim the bark and then kind of break it up. You put it into water like for about three, four days. And then after that, you can produce like a brownish style. With it. Like different, different shades of brown. So uh, I'll, I'll finish up with this, uh, this slide, these last few slides. This is one of the ladies that I talked about. My, my grandmother's uh, cousin. This is uh, Lucy Whitehorse. She produced this rug for me right here. This is that rug there that she's standing next to. And uh, she's traveled the world doing rug expeditions. One year she won the uh, best of show there at Santa Fe in the market. And that in itself is a great honor. To, to win that show and this is one of her other patterns she, she makes a, a double pattern Tizan's bus design rug and there she is with her with her winning rug award winning rug and her mom Ruth Yabney used to the, produce a simmer weave and her her rugs were even larger than this one and then uh this one's kind of neat because one of the things that they don't teach anymore as well in in like a lot of the younger weavers of, of, of modern day, they don't teach them that these rugs are like humans. They, the the elder weavers they used to talk about them as their as their children. They would say Led Harshinawa. You know, she she said Anawa, meaning that they're their, their, their rugs are somewhere out in a different part of the country. They're traveling. They're living with another another family. And then they also taught about how each rug was a... There's a male and female side to a rug. And so if you look at it here, this is a very good example. If you look right down to the center, this is where it starts. Which side do you think is the male rug? The side of the male what size is a female? So this size is a male. And that size is a female. Look at the pattern in the middle. See how that central diamond on the male side is a little bit larger. And then the female side is kind of smaller. And then look at that maroon hooks right next to the middle of Mota. On the male side, the hooks are a little bit wider. Whereas the female side, it's narrower. Then look at this tree here. Look at the top one. How it's offset a little bit more to the male side. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at right here on this design, this is reddish in color. Reddish in color, there's a little bit more maroon in color. This one does not have a leg at the base of the central pattern. This one has a leg in the middle of the central pattern. So that's what a, a, a lot of these uh, weavers did when they wove their rugs. They would uh, incorporate all these old ancient teachings. And it was, uh, like I said, it was a way for them to protect themselves. It extended their, their weaving uh, careers. And they said that when you weave perfectly all the time, you shorten up your weaving career. So that's what I like to close. And thank you.